to make sure that we have a pretty good sound level, Larry. I have to lean in a little bit on this mic, but not too much, I think. Is uh, everybody hearing? A couple of hands waving. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, if you can hear me on the speakers. Uh, welcome everybody to the cardio lecture for 2021. We're gonna talk about some common EKG abnormalities, how to spot them, what they might mean uh, in part one. And then in part two, we have a special guest to talk about our cardiac testing flow sheet, and if we have time to touch on a couple of issues in cardiology right now. So common EKG abnormalities, just some common abnormalities that get sent to the cardiologist, how to diagnose these. We're gonna work more on pattern recognition rather than strict criteria from EKG textbooks, uh, because I think pattern recognition is really um, how most of us do it. It's pretty quick and it's usually correct. And it's our job, if uh, you send it to us, to really be rigorous and, and go through all the rules anyway. Clinical significance of these, where we can point that out. Uh, sometimes you can, you can talk about uh, clinical associations. Other times, it's more of a pure EKG phenomenon. Uh, the EKGs that we're using tonight are from our own system, using the midmark. So the appearance should be consistent with most of the EKGs that you see. Uh, so I, I culled them from people that have been sent to me and from my own patients because we're on the mid-mark, and I, I notice most of the groups are uh, at this point. I think for this kind of EKG reading, that's really important because you have to get used to the different formats and, and different ways of displaying things. This is a really nice standard format. Okay, implications of abnormal findings. Always want to think about chronic findings versus acute. The most important EKG to look at is the previous EKG. I always tell patients that. If we see a big change on the EKG, we're worried that something's happened to the heart. If there's been something that's been there uh, time and time again on multiple tracings, it's probably just going to be something that we have to explain and maybe look for any associated uh, disease, but it probably doesn't rec rec uh, represent a big clinical event. Uh, relation to any symptoms, again, very important. The asymptomatic patient, versus the symptomatic. That's gonna change the whole tone of the conversation you have with your specialist, gonna change the whole tone of how closely you're gonna follow that patient if there are symptoms. Uh, findings on EKG that can signal future heart problems or a negative prognosis. We wanna know that because even if you have an asymptomatic patient with that issue, you're gonna follow them more closely. Uh, abnormalities that are likely to progress, that's typically conduction defects, and we'll see one or two of those. Uh, you're going to look for other possible explanations for these patterns on the EKG. Sometimes there is a common disease association, but there's something else too. Body habitus, for example, or uh, an obvious accelerated hypertension can sometimes produce some of these patterns. Uh, other testing that may help evaluate patients with these findings. So is there a way to kind of look deeper? There almost always is a way to look deeper than just the EKG and see if what you're, what you're looking at is truly representing disease or not. Uh, this is just the laundry list of the patterns we're going to go through. So we'll look at two or three examples of each one of these findings, and then we'll talk a little bit with a summary slide about what they mean. And the abnormalities are left anterior fascicular block, uh, left bundle branch blocks, the incomplete and the complete, right bundle branch blocks, Bifascicular block, which is almost always taken to mean right bundle branch block plus a left anterior fascicle block. Abnormal ST segments. Um, MI patterns and pseudo MI patterns should be switched around. We're going to do the pseudo MI first, which I think are more interesting. And we'll just touch on some classic MI patterns. Uh, subtle atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, how to pick that up and why it matters. Okay, so for this first slide, we just want to kind of get comfortable and get oriented. We see a very regular QRS pattern, and we see P waves, so we're thinking about sinus rhythm here. There's no tricks on any of these EKGs. What we notice looking at it is that we see negative deflections in the QRS in the inferior leads. That's 2, 3, and AVF. And when, you're, when your general QRS uh, is negative, more negative than positive in a lead, we call that a negative deflection. 
with this. This is part and parcel of the left anterior fascicular block. In fact, a severe left axis deviation. We remember that the signal, the electric signal is moving across the heart in kind of a northwest southeast direction. Uh, and if it's more left than that, it's skewed towards the left, that's a left axis deviation. We look for our uh, typical up in one and up in F. If we don't see that, if we see up in one and down in F, we're thinking uh, that there's an axis deviation. And our tiebreaker lead is lead two. If your deflection is more negative than positive in lead two, that's going to be by definition more negative than negative 30. Again, almost always, if you have a severe left axis deviation, you're up there in Eindhoven's circle and you're deviated more to the left, it's almost always from a left anterior fasciculum. This is just another example. I think it's even more of a classic example because one thing we notice about LAFB is that the QRS complex is often normal. Only part of the left conduction system is blocked and you still have good conduction everywhere else and you end up with a normal or a slightly prolonged QRS complex. So these look like nice, crisp, normal QRSs. Again, looking at two, three, and AVF, the inferior leads, we see that the bias towards negative deflection. Also very good to notice that these aren't Q waves. You don't start with a negative deflection. You have R wave first. And even if that R wave is tiny, it counts. And then you're not talking about a Q wave. Why is that important? Because that's the main difference between infarction and this conduction block. So I'll point out those R waves. So when we see that, this is not an inferior MI, this is an LAFB. Okay, left axis deviation is usually caused by this issue, left anterior hemiblock, so the terms are often used interchangeably. There are many causes for it, just left ventricular hypertrophy and even mild hypertension uh, can produce it. Of course, coronary artery disease, if you get some damage to the electrical system in that particular area can produce it, and thin people can also have it just by their body habitus. Up to 50% of patients with LAFB may have some cardiac disease. Usually, that's hypertension. Uh, and then just some uh, bullet points at the bottom there. Look for that axis more negative than negative 30. You're looking for that RS pattern in 2, 3, and AVF. Maybe a slightly prolonged QRS, but we saw in that second tracing totally normal QRS duration. If you're positive in lead one, negative in lead three, lead two is the deciding lead, the tiebreaker. Ken, they're telling me they can't see your... Uh, when I'm pointing out? What you're pointing. I, I wonder if you can use the mouse okay. and if there's a cursor. Let's see if we can. I saw it for a minute here. There you go. Okay, I so we'll go back. Way to do it. I appreciate that correction. Let's go back and look just one last time at those R waves right here, this little start. That's a really small R wave, but it counts. And my cursor went away, there it is. And right here, all these. So that's in your three inferior leads. If you don't see that R wave, that's important because now we're moved into uh, a discrepancy, a, a disease we're gonna get into in about five slides from now, which is MI. So I appreciate you guys pointing that out. I, I was pointing and I go out of the video frame, I think, when I do that with my hands. So we'll, we'll use the mouse here. Okay, moving into left bundle branch block. This is one that the computer reading usually gets it correct. And we'll see up here it did. It, sh it should look like a really a pattern that you've seen many times before, a big negative QRS in V1 and V2, sometimes also in V3, and the width of the QRS. It's really wide. It's stretched out. You'll also see uh, a double peak pattern that almost reminds us of a right bundle in V5 and V6 sometimes, and this one has it. So I like to tell people it looks like a mountain range. There's more than one jagged peak there. It's wide. And we get a little hint of what the right bundle looks like. 
over in this one lead in V6. But this is where you're really going to make your diagnosis. And again, the computer is usually correct on these because the QRS being so wide is the giveaway. Okay, this is the busiest slide we have on the whole presentation, so bear with me on this one. We'll try to get through it pretty quick here. Uh, hypertensive heart disease and coronary artery disease are the most common causes of left bundle branch block. So just some hypertension that has stressed the myocardium, often that's enough to cause this. A uh, large cohort, of course, the Framingham study found that 1% to 2% of people developed this over 18 years. These were patients, some of them who had antecedent disease, some of them who didn't, but they were followed uh, for, for many years. And uh, that was about the percentage that, that developed over that time period. Most actually did. If they developed left bundle branch block, they had coronary disease or they had at least hypertension. If it's caused by MI, usually the lesion is going to be severe and anterior MI will be the most common. Makes sense. What do I mean by caused by MI? Well, if your patient didn't have it before on the, the tracing, and then they have a, re a clinically recognized event of a myocardial infarction, and they have left bundle afterwards, that was caused by that MI. And in that case, it is a prognostic sign, and it's a negative prognosis. Um, idiopathic. And secondary cardiomyopathies are also really common causes of left bundle branch block. In fact, about 15% of patients with cardiomyopathy, and similarly, 15% of patients with significant aortic stenosis are going to have a left bundle branch block. So we see some ideas popping up in our mind when we see a left bundle about a, some several possibilities here. By significant AS, I, I mean uh, moderate to severe or severe aortic stenosis. Again, think of just stress on the LV, the, uh, the muscle. Uh, benign left bundle branch block also exists in patients with no cardiac disease. Just to confuse us, just to make life a little more difficult, there is a benign form of left bundle branch block, and you look at these patients with imaging, and you find no cardiac disease. Of course, the prognosis with LBBB varies considerably depending on the cause and the findings. In the absence of other findings, so we're looking at this benign LBBB now, the prognosis is actually favorable. 92% survival at 10 years studied in a U.S. Air Force study. The median age was 40 years in those folks. But that's good. A suggestion was uh, by me is an echocardiogram first, followed by a calcium score, if your patient's truly asymptomatic. So if they're symptomatic, that's a whole other question, and then there's, there's multiple ways that we would want to evaluate that patient. Symptomatic's probably going to get a cardiology consultation, I would think. But for your truly asymptomatic patient who shows up with left bundle branch block, I would suggest that those two tests can really help you understand uh, what's going on. Okay, this is just the summary of what we talked about before because it's such an important slide. Two main groups emerge, those with cardiac disease, and those with no detectable cardiac disease. If you have evidence of heart disease, LBBB carries a negative prognosis. Infarct size, uh, progression to other conduction defect problems, even bradycardias, complete heart block. If there's no heart disease, it does not carry a bad clinical prognosis. However, it may signal in the future that we are going to develop cardiomyopathy or some other abnormality. So take that last statement um, with some caution. Okay, right bundle branch blocks, just a quick review on incomplete right bundle branch block. Uh, we see a lot of these. The computer is pretty good at reading these. We look at the RSR prime or the double peak in V1, sometimes in V2. So right here. I like to tell patients there's a delay in the signal. So the signal starts moving across the heart and it starts to fade away. The wave of depolarization is passing. Up, oh, here comes the second part of the signal. There's the delay and it has to trigger its uh, depolarization signal. And that's why we get two peaks there. And that's your incomplete right bundle branch block as opposed to complete, which will have a wider QRS. 
QR restoration here is nice and narrow, and it's based on the average of all these leads. And in many leads, you don't see that double peak. You just see the normal situation. Uh, here's another uh, example of uh, incomplete right bundle branch block. Again, a lot of normal looking leads here. Here's our double peak R, S, R prime in uh, lead one. So that's an incomplete right bundle branch block. Then we move into the complete right bundle branch block. Again, we'll see this R, S, R prime, but it's much more pronounced now and the QRS is much wider. In fact, one of the features here is this slightly up R wave. Here's the S coming down. Here's the second R wave, and it's somewhat wide. In this lead, we also see it. R, S coming down, second R wave coming up. Uh, one thing we notice, there's usually a deep and somewhat wide S wave in lead two in these folks. And there can be associated ST segment changes. When we see ST segments depressed with a complete right bundle branch block, they usually fit into this pattern in precordial leads, and they're usually not indicating any stress or strain acutely on the heart. It's just part of the right bundle branch block. Okay, incomplete right bundle branch block, pretty common, two to three percent of patients have it. You'll see it in a lot of your folks just on camp physicals and on uh, wellness checks, EKGs. It's usually not of any prognostic significance. As with LBBB, uh, right bundle branch block is associated with heart disease, can be a marker for severity. But in those without heart disease, it's associated with a benign course. Think of your patient that goes into the hospital, has a normal EKG, uh, but is hypoxic and short of breath, turns out to have a pulmonary embolism, and then develops right bundle branch block afterwards, then that, that's a negative prognostic sign. That means that was a really significant event that happened for the patient. Uh, the hallmark here is the QRS 120 milliseconds above that, wider than that, we call that a complete right bundle branch block. Uh, and then the secondary R wave in the precordial leads, as we talked about that R, S, R prime. Uh, other issues, it can follow right ventricular hypertrophy, right heart failure, pulmonary embolism, core pulmonale, blunt trauma to the chest, and it's often seen with heart transplant. And it's, it's just an expected finding with heart transplant, it has no negative value there. Okay, bifascicular block, we'll pick up the pace a little bit here. Uh, bifascicular block, we're really good at diagnosing right bundle branch block now. We see it here with the RSR prime, and here's our double peak up, down, up again. Now we throw in these negative complexes in the inferior leads. We're more negative deflection than we are positive deflection in all of these. So that's a left anterior hemiblock or LAFD plus right bundle branch block. So that's your bifascicular block in most cases. Here's another picture of it again. Uh, we're seeing the same kind of a pattern, different patient. Right bundle branch block over here with the wide QRS, left anterior fascicular block with all the negative complexes over here. Okay, significance of it. This is right bundle branch block with LAFB. Rarely you can have a left posterior fascicular block and that that's, it carries the same um, uh, wording in terms of bifascicular block, but most of the time we're talking about the much more common situation. It implies a more diffuse involvement of conduction system disease on two different fascicles, two different electrical pathways in the heart are affected. You have the prolonged QRS and RS, R prime and V1, that's your right bundle branch block. And you have your left axis deviation, which is the other part of bifascicular block. Mostly this is caused by hypertension, coronary disease, aortic valve disease, and cardiomyopathy. So we're seeing a common theme. Uh, it can be important in pre-op evaluation as it can lead to transient complete heart block during surgery. Uh, because of the nature of this problem and the way we use anesthetics, the anesthesiologist needs to know that if they have a bifascicular block. It's rare to see it, but 
you're always glad if you pick that up before time and they're prepared to temporarily pace that patient, whatever they need to do to get them through surgery. Okay, just some thoughts on ST segment changes. Uh, we see them here with slight uh, ST segment depression and with T wave inversion. Also here, just a bit, this is just more pure T wave inversion. But I would submit to you that these segments are depressed. And we're gonna look at a couple of different patients that have very different clinical presentations, but very similar EKGs. So this is patient one. Patient two, very similar type of situation. I know there's some artifact here, but in this lead, I think you can see that the baseline is over here, slightly lower in the ST segment and very similar, well-defined, but inverted T waves. You can see my notes up here. This is unchanged from tracings from a few weeks before. So when we look at this patient, this was a patient that had a little bit of hypertension and nothing else. Totally negative stress testing, normal patient. When we look at this previous, this is somebody who failed their stress test in a major way with anterior apical ischemia extensive. And you can see how similar they look. This is the patient with disease. That's the patient with very similar findings and no disease. This one, you look again and you see some ST segments uh, slightly depressed. You see T waves inverted. You see it here and here again. But the thing you immediately notice is the height of the QRS. And by the atypical criteria, this is LVH. So when we see this sort of pattern, this is a very common cause of ST segments depressed. This is LVH with strain. And this was a patient who just came to us for uh, very minimal, if any, symptoms. I think it was really just for this EKG abnormality. So abnormal ST segments can signify ischemia or cardiac injury, but often caused by LVH with strain or the classic early repolarization pattern in healthy teens and adults, certain medications, accelerated hypertension, or in associated with those bundle branch blocks like we talked about. You often see ST segment depression with uh, right bundle branch block or even incomplete. The key is the chronicity and thus comparison to prior tracings is most helpful. Examples of these in patients with no cardiac disease and with minimally symptomatic patient with extensive disease. That was the examples we looked at. Okay, pseudo MI pattern. This is just a fun one. Uh, when we look at this, uh, initially we, we do see a left anterior fascicular block, but that's not the main finding here. What we're looking at is the lead V1 and V2. And what we should see is a little R wave in V1, and as we progress through two, three, four, five, and six, a growing R wave in relation to the S wave, becoming more positive, then becoming isoelectric, then becoming mostly positive. And in this lead, we see V1 has a little bit of an up R wave. That's, that's good. V2, though, has no R wave at all. So the computer is going to think that's a Q wave. There's no upward deflection before the QRS starts. That's a QA. And then in V3, we're back to a more normal situation. This is the same patient with the EKG taken at a different time, and now it starts to make sense. V1 now, where you're allowed to have a QS pattern, that is allowable, that's within normal, has the QS, and V2 is fixed. And now we see our nice normal pattern. I'll try to show it to you. QS here, R wave small, R wave getting bigger, R wave should be dominating out here. All that happened was this was a lead switch. Now the computer's happy, no myocardial infarction. With this one, and there was no intervening clinical event, the computer's saying anteroseptal infarct right here. So I would submit to you that's a pseudo infarct.
and that's just caused by switching lead V1 with V2, which is very easy to do. Uh, here's another one. I think we can say this is not an MI, but we can say it uh, because anteroseptal MI, which you see in the reading up here, is commonly called by the computer. Uh, but again, the computer sometimes doesn't synthesize everything together. So the automatic read doesn't synthesize all the different parts. Here we do have a QS pattern in V1 and V2. And then it starts to look more normal in V3, V4, and V5, and V6. And most of us would say, you know, a Q wave in one lead does not an MI make. But once you have two leads, you start to think about it. But what else do we see here? We see a pattern that almost looks like an incomplete left bundle branch block. It almost looks like those big negative QRS deflections in V1 and V2. There's a little width to it. We look over here and there's a little width to the QRS. It's not that nice, narrow, sharp uh, QRS. So this is probably an incomplete left bundle branch block. And when you have left bundle branch block or even incomplete, you can't diagnose MI because you'll see these changes. So I would submit that's a pseudo MI. Just to sum it up, uh, left anterior fascicular block is commonly diagnosed as inferior MI, both by the machine and by physicians. So we need to know the difference between LAFB and an inferior MI. It's those small R waves in the inferior leads we talked about. Uh, LVH can produce this. It's a frequent cause of poor R wave progression. And when the computer sees poor R wave progression, we don't have that growth of R wave V1 through V6. It'll it'll see that and often call that an anterior MI. Uh, but that's a pseudo MI pattern. COPD and core pulmonality cause the same poor R wave progression. They also cause some other findings, indeterminate access, and sometimes a right axis is a helpful clue in that situation. But that's a cause of pseudo MI. And lead switch is more common than you may expect. Think of this when you see abnormalities in the limb leads, but completely normal findings in the precordial leads or a, marks, a marked axis change from one EKG to the next. Usually people don't have a large change in the axis in a short period of time on their tracings. That makes you think about a lead switch artifact too. You always try to compare it to a prior tracing. Okay, subtle atrial fibrillation. Um, what you like to see is some irregularity of the QRS, the pattern there. Uh, you also like to see, oh, I'm sorry, that's uh, pseudo MI patterns is done. We've moved to the true MI now. We're not to AFib yet. Sorry about that. I was thinking this looks very regular for an atrial fibrillation <laughs> tracing, so I had to correct myself there. Very regular with P waves uh, before every QRS is a good sign. Uh, we're just trying to show that this is somebody with a pattern that really does look like um, an old anterior infarct. You see not much growth of any R wave forces all the way through V1 through V6. Uh, the computer also threw in a bonus here, the old inferior infarct. And I think you have to agree with this one because the QRS is so small here that any Q wave that exists, even this very small Q wave, is a significant part of your overall QRS complex. And we said one lead does not an infarct mate, but two leads probably does. At least you ha it's your burden then to prove that they don't have an infarct. So I probably would call this. This lead, it would be great if we also saw Q wave here. I'm not sure it's so small there that I have to give the computer its due and say it probably is inferior infarct. And then this is very suspicious for an old anterior infarct. That's just to show you the true pattern. So Q waves are your key findings. Initial negative deflection from the baseline in the inferior lateral anterior leads. That's what makes an MI. And you need that in at least two leads. You like the leads to be in an anatomically consistent location, like the inferior leads the anteroapical leads, the lateral leads, or the anteroseptal. You'd like them to make sense and, and be grouped together. Machine interpretation will call infarct when any grouping of leads are showing Q waves. Keep in mind some Q waves are normal. Lead three, that's a normal Q wave. 
lead V1, that QS pattern in V1 is an, often a normal finding. And then sometimes we see small Q waves in healthy young people, and we know those are septal depolarization. Um, the initial depolarization of the septum is opposite vector. It's a little technical, but it's opposite from the typical um, predominant QRS vector. So they can be septal depolarization. Small Q waves can be normal. When we're trying to decide if they're truly signs of an infarct, echo or a nuclear perfusion scan can be very helpful. Okay, I want to be real careful about what I call this next one here. So I'm going to look at three. Okay, we'll start with the one everybody likes, atrial flutter. We can tell this is atrial flutter uh, because there are no P waves, there are flutter waves. We see the characteristic sawtooth pattern, negative flutter waves coming at this specific interval, say from 270 to 320 cycles uh, per minute. That is the atrial flutter circuit when we see that. And you can see that your QRS can be pretty regular. Uh, flutter can be a pretty stable rhythm if you've set up the right um, relationship between upper chambers and lower chambers in terms of the, the block and the conduction. The rate here is about 75, so we think that's about a 4 to 1 atrial rate to ventricular rate. And it looks pretty regular for the QRSs, uh, but that's atrial flutter. A lot of rhythms get called atrial flutter. This is the classic one. Moving back, atrial fibrillation. The computer got this right, I think. You're just mostly looking not for a, a real tachycardia or a high-speed uh, rhythm. You're looking for that irregularity. And you're looking for that irregularity with no clear P waves that are consistent. Your best leads to look for P waves, of course, V1 and V2, and a lead 1 and lead 2. Those are your best, best ones to look. And we see a little bumpy, bumpy pattern here, but it is not the consistent, the classic sawtooth pattern that we saw with atrial flutter. So I would not call this flutter. That's, that's atrial fibrillation. And here's another pattern that you'll see where you really notice when you hold this out in front of your face, just the irregularity. There's, there's no real repeating RR interval. It's really inconsistent. And when we look in the baseline, this is a pretty clean tracing. There's not a whole lot of shake or artifact. And we see just some noise, just a little up and down noise in the baseline. That's atrial fibrillation. OK, subtle atrial fibrillation. Why important to, to notice that you, you all are familiar with this. They can be at risk for periods of clinically unrecognized tachycardia. Uh, and that can lead to cardiomyopathy, even if they're la largely asymptomatic. The major risk is that of thromboembolic stroke which needs to be calculated. Their risk points on the risk point scale with the chads vask score, and that should be treated. OK, so summary. Most or all of these abnormalities on EKG that we see can be associated with disease or can be seen in patients with minor or no cardiac disease at all. Other common findings seen in patients with completely normal hearts would be that QS pattern, normal QS in V1, Q wave in lead three, ST segment depression in early repolarization, young, healthy people, and T-wave inversions of various types. It's a very nonspecific finding, T-wave inversion. Lead reversal is more common than you think. So think about that when you see something that just doesn't make sense. Most of these should be followed in the office. If there is some clinical suspicion, an echocardiogram can often help reassure the doctor and patient that these don't represent active disease. Also, cardiology would be glad to see any of these issues to help clarify. We get a lot of these, and it's always a happy event when you can explain what's going on to your patient. And oftentimes, it leads to a very significant workup and, uh, and diagnoses that need, to be, that need to be addressed. Okay, we're going to move into part two of the talk. So we'll take maybe a two-minute break, Larry, just sure. a two-minute vocal break. A guest for discussion today, please welcome Dr. Graywall. He's coming up in just a minute. We're going to talk about the cardiac testing flow chart that we've been talking about for a couple of months now. And if there's time, just touch on COVID-19 and some cardiac involvement and what Dr. Graywall's seen in the hospital. See you back in a bit. Thank you. Thank you. 
much. Sure. Really appreciate it. It's kind of dry material. Yeah. We do. We've got about a minute. Yeah. Ken, at the end, too, if, if you want to make mention about your April 5th, you know, yes. availability. Yeah, the Monday no. mornings that we're starting. Yeah. yeah. A rapid uh, assessment of AFib would try to get the patients in. Just want to get that, and I've told them a separate phone number. So we yeah. can just address just those patients. Tell them you're working on it, and they'll hear more about it later. Okay. That's great. Yeah, audio be okay over here. Uh, we yeah. got that mic. Yeah, uh, these, these mics probably are live, but it'll be better if you're up at okay. the internet the podium. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of I'll come in and ask a question. I'll back off. Yeah, I'll come in and ask a question. I'll back off the audio. Okay. Forward. What's this one? Backward is this one? I actually had both of you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, would we sign in? I tried to sign in. I know, that's okay. I, I put you on my list already. Oh, thank you. So you know. With only two of you, hard to miss. Gotcha. I don't know what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to assume we're back and people can hear. Larry, it's yeah. sounding good? Should. Okay, our guest for discussion today, and hopefully it'll be uh, two cardiologists talking about uh, something near and dear to our hearts. That's uh, Dr. Graywall from the Ohio Health Cardiovascular Group. He is one of the stars of general cardiology and imaging over there, and uh, we're lucky enough to have him come and, and talk with me a bit today. We're going to talk about the flow chart and then maybe some COVID-19 issues. Um, I'll start with just some remarks, and then I'll let him come up to the microphone. Uh, the flow chart for cardiac testing, how it came about, we want to hear a little bit about that. We think of it as a tool for the primary care physicians to get your patient to the right test. It also can help us in that we find out how to use some of the advanced imaging at car in cardiology, some of the things that we don't do at COPC. We do a lot of things, but we don't do everything, uh, but they do do at the hospital systems. We'll also uh, have Dr. Graywall respond to some critique and some questions from the survey that went out to our docs uh, for looking at their two-page flow sheet, and maybe run through an example. Dr. Graywall. Uh, thanks a lot, Ken. Uh, appreciate the invitation, too, and uh, been uh, working with your physicians for over 20 years now, so I uh, appreciate the relationship. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, I'm a general cardiologist uh, that know many of you, and I work at Riverside Hospital. And we've been partnering with COPC uh, over the last year or so to kind of streamline the process of evaluating patients with suspected uh, coronary chest pain. Of course, this is a very common problem. It's a common problem in the emergency room and urgent care settings, and it's also very common in ambulatory settings in your offices. And that was part of the rationale for putting this uh, kind of algorithm together. Uh, the biggest challenge when someone comes to your office with, you know, shortness of breath, chest pain, or whatever clinical syndrome is, makes you suspicious of a cardiac etiology is, you know, first of all, the most important thing is making sure the patient's not actually having an acute coronary syndrome, and uh, because that's an emergency situation. So just like Ken was explaining with the EKG assessment, you know, with a basic history and usually an EKG that you can access in your office, you should be able to at least exclude an acute cardiac syndrome if they have resting EKG changes or an accelerated pattern of pain. Uh, that sounds cardiac. But once you've excluded that, then the challenge then is uh, in an ambulatory patient is trying to decide, you know, on, a, on what testing pathway to put the patient down in the uh, ambulatory setting. Now, at COPC, you have access to state-of-the-art testing in your own centers, uh, as with Ken's guidance and with our guidance uh, from Ohio Health as well, we've been, you know, uh, overseeing these cardiac centers that you have access to. So you have access to uh, state-of-the-art echocardiography, nuclear imaging as well, and I believe you have some access now to cardiac CTA that's yeah. in the process. 
Yeah, that's in the process. Yeah, so, um, so really, uh, uh, what we developed is basically a risk assessment tool, and your hospitalists are very familiar with this. It's called the Heart Score, and we use it all the time in the emergency room setting. And it basically takes five components: you know, the history, the EKG, the age, uh, risk factors, and the troponin level to create a risk score, zero to two for each of the five categories. Obviously, in an ambulatory setting, you don't have access to a troponin necessarily in every office, so we basically modified it for the other four categories: history age, risk factors, and um, uh, the rest in EKG. And on all four of those categories, you can get a score anywhere from zero to two. For example, with the EKG, just like Ken was alluding to in his first part of the talk, a normal EKG would be a score of zero. Non-specific findings, like some of the things he mentioned, would be a score of one. And then if a patient has definite ischemic changes, which could be ST, elevation, or depression, you would get a score of two. Uh, and there's similar criteria for history, age, and risk factors, and that's how you get a score from zero all the way up to eight. Uh, and generally, zero to two is considered low risk. Um, and once again, if this heart score re results in a high-risk patient, meaning they have EKG changes or multiple risk factors, uh, then that might be a patient who really needs to go to an emergency setting. But of course, that's hopefully the minority of most patients in an office setting. So most are going to be lower intermediate risk. And then that's going to lead into the decision tree for uh, selecting the testing. So a tool for the a tool for the PCPs to choose the right test. And I noticed in some of the comments that we had, some of the feedback uh, on this, that some physicians were thinking this could really help them do value medicine, really pick the right test, and even if you're spending more sometimes initially, avoid doing more than one test, and in the long run really save money. What do you think about that, Ken? Yeah, I think that's definitely a concern because uh, when, n number one, it's confusing because there is a lot of different testing available. And to a primary care provider, sometimes it is a tough decision because you have access to these different modalities. Um, secondly, some of the testing is very expensive, especially nuclear testing, you know. So in our algorithm, what we try to emphasize is that you kind of reserve nuclear testing for patients who have known coronary disease. Maybe they had a history of a stent or a, a cabbage, uh, or they have, you know, a, a, a high BMI, which would be a patient who might be non-diagnostic for one of the cheaper testings. But in general, you know, you want to favor stress EKG or stress echo because it is cheaper and also involves less radiation and less time to the patient and, and of course, uh, less overall cost. And that's kind of what the algorithm favors. But at the same time, you don't want to put someone through a test that's likely to be non-diagnostic because then that's going to add downstream costs. So the algorithm is trying to kind of uh, fine-tune based on a few key questions, you know, the, the right test for the right patient. So take us through somebody who would end up with one of the more state-of-the-art tests that you do at Riverside that we don't do at COPC. Well, the, really, the two state of the art tests we talk about are cardiac CTA yeah. and cardiac PET testing. Right. And PET testing is actually a type of nuclear imaging, but it uses a special camera. Um, it's really not necessarily a first line test for most patients, yeah. unless maybe somebody with a very high BMI who might be, you know, you'd be concerned about a non diagnostic test. But PET is really a very good test if they've already had a non diagnostic stress test uh, for whatever reason. Um, or in the hospital setting, we use PET because, you know, we, may, we, we want the highest accuracy in patients who have already kind of committed to being admitted to the hospital. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but PET is basically a, a very, uh, uh, a very uh, high quality and high accuracy uh, type of nuclear testing, but it can only be done with vasodilator stress. It can't be done with exercise, so that also limits its use. Yeah. Now, cardiac CTA is very different. Cardiac CTA is really an excellent outpatient test. Uh, it's really not a stress test. It's an anatomic test where you can actually visualize the coronaries, as you know, yeah. um, and it can very accurately look for anatomic disease. Uh, but there are still some challenges with cardiac CTA. Number one, most insurers are not fully on board with it. So in the outpatient setting, you often have to go through preauthorization for cardiac CT. Uh, secondly, it's still technically demanding. I know you have some access to it here. Uh, we offer it at the hospital and in our office as well. Uh, but, you know, there are certain patients, maybe they have an arrhythmia, maybe they're above age 70, where they're going to have coronary calcification, who are probably not ideal candidates. But, yeah. but CT is an excellent test for a younger patient who maybe you have like a low to intermediate suspicion, 
because the real value is <clears throat> when it's totally normal, you've pretty much excluded coronary disease with 100% accuracy. So it's really uh, the uh, specificity of it that's really, really nice yeah. in that it can exclude disease. So the, the, that would be the CT candidate, uh, whereas most other patients still an exercise test is going to be a good first choice. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, just an example to run through, or let's say a 57-year-old uh, a woman with uh, maybe two risk factors and intermediate symptoms. Let's run through that on your chart and see where we would end up with. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that would be probably your classic intermediate risk patient based on her age. Yeah. The fact that she has a couple risk factors. Get you back to where you were. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're there. So in a patient like that, you know, the first, the, the two key questions you want to ask is, can the patient exercise adequately? So you'd want to ask the patient, can you walk at a steady pace, let's say three miles an hour? Or another way to ask is, can you climb a flight of stairs without having to stop? If they say yes and that they're comfortable on a treadmill, you're always going to want to pick a treadmill stress test first because you get a lot of extra information from the treadmill, sure as you do. know very well. You, sure you can reproduce their symptoms. You can look at their overall uh, exercise Even capacity. prognostic information. You get. Yeah, exactly. So, so. Assuming that she says she can exercise, I would pick an exercise test. And it sounds like she has no history of coronary disease, so we probably don't need to go straight to nuclear imaging. Yeah. So this might be a patient where stress echo is going to be a good first choice. Even a stress EKG, although, you know, stress EKG, as you know very well, you know, the sensitivity and specificity are just challenging. So it's yeah. a lot of those patients end up needing a second test. But if the patient really can exercise at a high level and maybe your suspicion is more on the low side, you know, a younger patient, and you just want to exclude anything high risk, that's where a stress ECG helps. But in a patient like her, I would start with a stress echo. And then if her BMI happened to be high, you might consider going straight to nuclear. So show us how that will look on the flow sheet. And again, you can use your cursor, right? Yeah, it takes about a second to catch up. There. Yeah, and I, I want to preface this by saying this is just a draft of our flow algorithm. We actually have been collecting feedback from many of your colleagues, and we're planning to actually, uh, we, we found some ways to simplify this. But basically, the first step is if the patient has a history of coronary disease or a high BME, BMI, which in this case doesn't seem to be the case, then you would go straight to nuclear, whereas otherwise you can go into the uh, non-nuclear pathway. It sounds like your EKG is normal, so that's good news, because if it was abnormal with, say, a bundle branch block or some other changes, then that might make exercise a challenge. But if it's normal, uh, then uh, then we're going to go, uh, uh, and she's under uh, age 70, then that's where our options now are either stress echo or treadmill exercise. And in her case, CTA might be an option since she has no uh, history of coronary disease and she's under age 70. So. You know, in many situations, more than one test is going to be a, a good initial choice. So I'd say for her, if you had access to a good quality CTA, that would be a good option. Otherwise, maybe a stress echo. And then people talk a lot about cardiac MRI now, too. And cardiac MRI can be a very valuable test for perfusion studies, particularly in people with hibernating myocardium, stunned myocardium. How do you kind of work in cardiac MRI to your ischemic heart disease workup, Kenny? Yeah, I would still consider MRI a pretty advanced uh, test that's only going to be used in certain cases. It's, first of all, it's, you know, pretty expensive. It's still very challenging to do with stress. You know, we do a lot of resting MRI for, you know, cardiomyopathy, evaluating cardiac masses. Um, and we have, you know, really some uh, state-of-the-art imagers available now to, to do MRI uh, on the cardiac side. But stress is still a challenge. So really, a, a minority of patients, you would go to stress unless it's a really a more advanced question, uh, like a viability or something, which would probably be guided by a cardiologist. Yeah. So I think it'd be pretty rare that we would go with MRI as a first-line study in the uh, outpatient setting. Yeah. Well, thank you for really providing that clarity. I want to uh, move ahead to a, a slide now um, that I have prepared and get your feedback on this, too. So that was our flow sheet. COVID-19 and the heart, just a real quick, just to get your, Kenny, your kind of see if your experience is similar um, in terms of inpatients with COVID-19 and the heart. Just some facts and figures from a study. Uh, November 3rd of 2020, Journal of American Cardiology, uh, College of Cardiology, 309 hospitalized patients. Three categories emerged in these folks. They were hospitalized, so they were 
moderately severe or severe, severe illness with COVID-19. Um, three categories emerged, those with no evidence of myocardial injury, so no enzyme elevation, no EKG changes, just lung findings. Evidence of myocardial injury, but with no echo abnormality, and then evidence of injury with echo abnormalities. And you can see echo abnormalities were a large predictor of mortality and of hospital course. 5.2 versus 18 versus 31.7 mortality in, in hospital mortality for these folks. And the hazard ratio was quite high, as you can see. The main abnormalities that you saw in the folks who were very sick with COVID-19 were LV segmental wall motion defects. So for example, inferior wall motion abnormality or anterior. Global hypokinesis, so an overall uh, global myocardial LV systolic dysfunction, or drop in the ejection fraction. RV dysfunction and pericardial effusion. They also mentioned diastolic dysfunction uh, as a possibility too, but uh, that one I think sometimes is a bit overdiagnosed, so I left it out. Some local experience, inpatient and outpatient. So can you just kind of, you know, give me your reflection working at Riverside if that's kind of what you're seeing with these patients, and then talk a little bit about outpatient assessment when folks send you a patient who's had COVID-19 and they're worried about myocarditis or they're worried about cardiac involvement. Yeah, so I think the key distinction is between inpatients who require hospitalization with COVID and then kind of the uh, routine COVID positive patients we all see in our practices, maybe incidental testing or maybe a mild illness. In hospital patients who are sick enough to be in the hospital, you absolutely see frequent cardiac involvement. I think a lot of studies have shown like a positive troponin in about 30% of hospitalized patients and then the echo changes you mentioned. So in the hospital, we're on a for cardiac complications by keeping them on telemetry, checking an echo, monitoring the cardiac markers. But, you know, obviously that's a minority of COVID patients. Now most COVID positives are incidental testing or mild illness in the ambulatory yeah. setting, and that's very different. Actually, cardiac involvement, as we've gotten more experience with it, has turned out to be very, very uncommon in mild outpatient uh, infections. Um, so, you know, the approach we advocate, and we actually put together some COVID uh, testing guidelines, uh, especially for athletes and high school kids, you know, in terms of return to school and return to play for athletes. And really the key thing is, is that if the illness is mild, if it's predominantly upper respiratory, and they're not having any associated chest pain, exertional dyspnea, or any of those symptoms, they really don't need any specific cardiac evaluation. Uh, they can just return to normal activity once they're out of quarantine and just be monitored to see if any of those symptoms develop. However, if a patient does have either chest tightness, persistent dyspnea, even after they recover from the acute infection, that's where on the outpatient side, you know, checking an EKG, maybe checking a troponin because obviously myocarditis is the biggest concern and, and a troponin would check for that, or even doing an echocardiogram to look for any signs of pericarditis and myocarditis, then it can be helpful in those patients who are having those symptoms. And then if any of those are abnormal, we would think about doing a cardiac MRI, which is still kind of the gold standard to look for uh, myocarditis, uh, but really only a small minority of all COVID outpatients really are gonna require that. And the same applies to high school athletes, because this is really the big ambulatory question we all get all the time now is clearing these athletes or uh, school age and college age uh, patients for return to activity. And so the same guidelines apply if it's a mild infection or it's an asymptomatic, incidental asymptomatic positive, most can just you know, be cleared to, for activity, but then it's the ones with those extra symptoms where you think about doing the echo, troponin or EKG and maybe having them see a cardiologist. So to wrap it up, uh, I'll ask you two little more bites on the myocarditis apple here. Uh, 1%, is that a rule of thumb for all comers in COVID infection that we see and the docs worried about myocarditis because of some symptoms? Is it about 1%? Yeah, probably even less in outpatients, uh, but it may be 1% or more in hospitalized patients. Okay. Uh, and we also don't know what it means when someone may have a mild elevated troponin, but a normal echo and other things. I mean, does that really mean they had myocarditis? It's hard to say. Uh, we know that that prognosis is probably worse if that's setting, so we kind of treat it like they have that, but we still don't have enough data to know what the long-term consequences are going to be. Yeah. And a couple of studies I looked at with athletes 
post COVID-19 with myocarditis. Um, a couple of studies mentioned that we haven't seen any deaths in these groups. Is that because we're just being very vigilant with COVID-19 patients and we're not sort of under-diagnosing, if anything, we're over-diagnosing myocarditis in COVID-19? Yeah, I don't know. If, uh, it, that's a hard one to answer because, you know, obviously uh, patients with serious COVID infection can have morbidity for multiple reasons and it might be hard to sort out what could be cardiac from other causes. I mean, there's definitely been sudden death in COVID positive patients, both athletes and just the general public when they've been sick. Yeah. But the mechanism isn't really clear if it's just an arrhythmia or is it underlying myocarditis. I think you have to be vigilant for it and we still have to assume err on the side of being cautious in terms of looking for it uh, and also having these uh, athletes refrain from activity, uh, which is the general recommendation for anybody with myocarditis. Um, but I think it's, time will tell, you know, what the real incidence is going to be. It's definitely on the low side, but that doesn't mean we can't be vigilant about it. And of course, the whole another issue is the issue of myocarditis with the vaccine itself, yeah. <laughs> uh, which was another big controversy a lot in the media. Of questions. Yeah. And once again, it's a legitimate thing where pa uh, young patients can get a very mild myocarditis from the vaccine, but more data has shown that it's once again very rare, probably one in 10,000. Yeah. Certainly not a reason not to get the vaccine. Uh, but it is another thing we have to, you know, be vigilant for. And one last question, ultrasonic tissue characterization of these kind of things, myocarditis, fibrosis. Um, are you seeing that? Is your echo resolution good enough to see ultrasonic tissue descriptions or do you need to go to a cardiac MRI for most of these things? Yeah, I would say echo is probably not good enough to really characterize that. Uh, you know, there are some classic findings on echo of myocarditis, but it's usually patients with pretty sick disease and pretty advanced disease. So there's no doubt that MRI is more sensitive. So when we really have a clinical question about clearing an athlete or someone else, you know, we do go to MRI, which is very accurate, but, uh, but obviously not something you want to offer on every patient. Well, I want to thank Dr. Candy Graywall very much today for making this more than a one-man show and hopefully making it very interesting to, to bounce things off his expertise and what he's seeing in the hospital. Thanks a lot, Dr. Grable. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Okay. And we appreciate everybody who tuned, tuned in. And, uh, oh, I wanted to mention one more thing, and that's that we're starting a rapid AFib clinic. It's going to be official now. We've been kind of beta testing it. There'll be more to come, more announcements about this, but it'll be a way for you to get AFib patients in quickly uh, to our clinic to see me. We'll have a special time slot set aside and we'll have a plan for both uh, getting them on initial good treatment and a plan for restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm for these folks. So more to come on that. Thank you, everybody.